Hello, hello, hello from Clinic Reviews. It's Dr. Sharon. We are the best NCLEX review in the entire world, in my opinion. So welcome. We're going to be talking about atrial dysrhythmias today. And um, the last video that I posted, the basic ECG video, has gotten a good response. I think a lot of people struggle with this. So let's get started. Haven't done that in a while. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So um, you can tell that uh, the screen is what I do when I need to have a PowerPoint up. And so actually, I know I was making lots of noise with my paper, but I have nothing on my paper. I just wanted to make the noise. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I just want to remind you what we talked about the last time with sinus rhythms. Remember that if we have an upright P wave, we have an upright P wave, that means it is a sinus node is firing, and a narrow QRS, that means it's traveling fast through the ventricles. I'm writing with my finger, so that's why I look like I have a horrible handwriting, although I do have horrible handwriting, there's no question about that. So we have a narrow QRS, an upright P wave. If the rate is between 60 and 100, it's normal sinus rhythm. If it's less than 60, it's sinus Brady. And if it's over 100, but less than one or 140 or less, it's sinus tachycardia. So just an example here, we have our upright P waves. Narrow QRSs, and narrow QRS means that it is uh, less than or equal to 0 0.10. And 0 0.10 is two and a half small boxes. So let me go ahead and just make this a little bigger for you. So let me find one that starts on a line here. It looks like this one starts on a line right here. So we have, this one starts on a line and it goes across, it looks like it goes across, it's hard for me to see. It goes across maybe, one and a half boxes. So one and a half boxes is 0.04 plus 0.02 because a half a box is 0.02 to get 0.06. And so that is by definition a narrow QRS because QRS has to be less than or equal to 0.10. So we have an upright P wave and a narrow QRS, which means this is a sinus rhythm. If you're like, Sharon, I don't understand what you're doing, then you just got to go back to the last video and watch it and you'll understand it. So each small box is 0.04 seconds. Five small boxes equals one big box. That's what this, these big boxes are. One big box is 0.20 seconds because 0.04 plus 0.04 plus 0.04 plus 0.04 plus 0.04 equals 0.20. And that's five small boxes in each big box. So each big box is 0.20 seconds. And so that means that five big boxes, one, two, three, four, five, five big boxes is one second. So that means one, two, three, four, five seconds, six seconds. So we have one, two, three, four, five. We have a six second strip here. And so if you want to figure out the heart rate, you count the number of QRX complexes in six seconds, multiply it by 10, and that equals the heart rate. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here the heart rate equals 70. And since it's between 60 and 100, this is a normal sinus rhythm. Now that's a complete just review of the last uh, video that I posted. So if you're like, yeah, 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 I got that. I watched the last video, Dr. Sharon, I'm good. Then you're good. Let's move on to atrial rhythms. If you're like, no, 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 I don't get that. Go back and rewatch the previous video. I talk about it in depth there. So let's talk about atrial rhythms. Now, remember the first word of the name of the rhythm tells you where the electrical impulse is starting. So sinus rhythms start in the sinus node. Atrial rhythms start somewhere in the atria, not the sinus node, but somewhere in the atria. Ventricular rhythms start in the ventricles. Now, the sinus node, remember, is the most reliable thing we have in our body. It beats 60 to 100 times a minute for up to 100 years, sometimes longer. And it never takes a break, never goes on vacation, never takes a nap, never says, I'm just tired, I need a snack. 
Well, sometimes it says, I'm tired, I need a snack, and then you go, yeah, I'm hungry. But it doesn't stop just because it's, it's tired and needs a snack. I hate to get off track here. It can stop if someone is malnourished enough. The heart can just stop, which is why anorexia nervosa can kill people. Because anorexia nervosa is a, is a psychological disorder where people have a distorted body image, and as such, they ingest an extremely low amount of calories. And if, if you are not ingesting enough calories and you used up all your caloric stores, like we store calories in our fat, in our muscles, right? We store calories there. And if you've used up all the, the stored calories, so you have no body fat, you're extremely low body weight, and you're not ingesting any calories, your heart can stop. So y'all, that's why anorexia nervosa kills people because the heart does need energy. And if it's not getting it, it will stop. But Usually it'll tell you it's hungry before it does that. That's why we, well, that's not the only reason we feel hungry, but that's one of the reasons we feel hungry. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about atrial flutter. So this is an atrial rhythm, which means the impulse is not starting in the, eight, in the sinus node. It's starting somewhere in the atria. So here's my lovely heart. And so it's starting somewhere in the atria. It's not starting in the sinus node. Now, I'm not going to talk about the pathology of atrial flutter, in atrial fib, it's rather complicated. What I want you to know is that it's, it's the atria are firing too fast. Okay, the atria are firing too fast. And in a flutter, it's firing too fast for one reason. In a fibrillation, it's firing too fast for another reason. But they're both where the atria are firing too fast. Now, here's the reality. We have the SA note is here and the AV node is here. If you don't know this is the AV node, then maybe you haven't finished nursing school yet. If you don't know what the AV node is, maybe you should go back and review your anatomy. But the AV node is in the middle of the heart. It's another bundle of cells that can uh, control heart rate if it's given a chance. Normally it doesn't. Normally the SA node controls heart rate. But the AV node is there. And here's the reality. The SA node and the AV node have signed a contract for life. They signed a contract for life. So they negotiated, before the heart ever started beating, they negotiated a contract. And the AV node said to the SA node, look, we don't want to work so hard. The SA node is the boss. You know how, how, how the S, when the boss is around, you work a little harder? You've ever noticed that? The SA node is, is the boss. And the AV node says, yeah, I get it. You're here. You're in charge. I got to work a certain amount, right? I, I got to work hard. But I don't want to work too hard. You're the one get, making all the money. I'm not making any money. I'm just the grunt work. You're making all the money. I don't want to work as hard as you do, or I don't want to have to work too hard. And the SA note says, fine, how hard are you willing to work? And the AV note says, I will accept between 60 and 100 electrical impulses every minute, because that's what you're supposed to fire, SA note. You're only supposed to fire 60 to 100 times a minute. And if you decide you want to work harder than that, I'm not going to accept more electrical impulses than that. And it says... Every once in a while, I may accept a more electrical impulses. Like if, if, our, if our person decides they want to jog, well, I'll, I'll accept more electrical impulses than that. If our, if our person decides they want to go for a jog, or if, if our person gets, um, uh, uh, gets someone break into the house in the middle of the night, I'll, I'll go a little faster than that because, you know, I don't want our person to die. But I'm not going to accept more electrical impulses just because you decide you want to send me more. And the SA note says, fine, I'm not going to, I won't send you more than 60 to 100, except in an emergency situation. The AV note says, fine, in an emergency situation, I'll accept more electrical impulses than that. And so then what happens is the SA node um, goes on vacation or decides to take a nap and they leave. And they're, they're not around right now. And the atria is like, oh, Oh, where's the boss? Where's the boss? I got to take over. So the atria decides they have to take over because the boss isn't around. And the atria says, ooh, 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 I can fire as fast as I want to. I didn't sign a contract with the AV node. I can fire as fast as I want to. So the atria start firing really, really fast. You know what the AV node says? Uh-uh, no, 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 no. Just because the boss is gone doesn't mean I have to accept more electrical impulses than what I agreed to. We had a contract. Our person is not in danger. They're not, uh, a dog's not chasing them. They don't have a midnight intruder. They're not going for a jog. You send me this many electrical impulses, I ain't taking them. I'm not taking them. 
I'm only taking as many as I agreed to take. So what we have here is we have, we still have a narrow QRS because the ventricles are still contracting really fast, so that's good. And what we have is a sawtooth P wave because the atria are in control, and so the P wave looks different, right? It's not just an upright rounded P wave. It looks different. It looks like this sawtooth pattern. And not only that, there's a bunch of them. So there's one, two, three. There's actually one in here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yikes, there's 19 P waves. And how many QRSs are there? How many QRSs? I'm write this, you can see it. How many QRSs are there in this same in the same area? One, two, three, four, five. There's five QRSs. Do you see the difference between the number of P waves and the number of QRSs? So we have more P's than QRSs. So the hallmark of, of atrial flutter is we don't have that typical P wave. We have this sawtooth P wave, and it's very distinctive. It looks just like this all the time, pretty much all the time. And the reason we call it sawtooth, I don't know if you've ever used a table saw, but a table saw has, has a blade on it that's round and you, you like put it on and you screw it on. And, and it's not just a, a smooth surface around because if it was a smooth surface around, it wouldn't cut as well. It actually has teeth on the sides and the teeth on the side of that saw blade is called a sawtooth. And it looks just like this. It looks a lot like that. And so that's why we call it a sawtooth P wave. So we have a sawtooth P wave but we have more P's than QRS's because the QRS is like, yeah, you're not getting me to take more electrical impulses than what I originally agreed to. We signed a contract and I'm not taking more. Now, sometimes the AV node uh, is a little confused or something else is going on and they end up taking more than they're supposed to. And so sometimes, sometimes the ventricles have a fast rate because the ventricles are taking way more electrical impulses than they were supposed to. And sometimes like this one, the rate is normal. And sometimes they go, yeah, no, I'm just tired, man. I'm just tired. You've been sending me too many impulses. And sometimes the ventricular rate is slow. So you cannot predict ahead of time what the ventricular rate is going to be. But the atrial rate is always very fast. And the ventricular rate is always slower than the atrial rate. So you always have more P's and QRS's. And the QRS is narrow. And you have a sawtooth P wave. So that right there is a classic atrial flutter. Now, even when the rate is normal, it's still a concern because when you go from a normal sinus rhythm to an atrial flutter, the, the risk is that you're going to throw a clot. The patient's going to throw a clot because now all of a sudden their atria are fluttering. And when it's fluttering like that, you have turbulent blood flow. And whenever you have, no matter where, whenever you have turbulent blood flow, the risk is that there's going to be a clot formed and you're going to throw a clot. So treatment for atrial flutter. First of all, we want to prevent clot formation. So you might get an order for heparin. They say, what, um, what is some of the meds you would expect to be ordered when someone's in atrial flutter? You say, well, heparin, if they just went into atrial flutter, but if they're in chronic atrial flutter, they may actually order the warfarin uh, because they, they may just let them live in atrial flutter, but they're also going to have to live on warfarin, which is an anticoagulant. So what you're concerned about is an anticoagulant. And then you're going to be concerned about ant giving them an antidysrhythmic. You're hoping if you can give them a medication that can actually convert them out of a flutter back into uh, sinus rhythm. And there's a medication that has been found to do that. It can, it's usually started IV uh, and then converted over to PO. So this med can be given IV or PO, and it's cardizem. So you expect them to be on an anticoagulant and an antidysrhythmic like cardizem. Now, if cardizem is not there and they give you the word, they give you the drug amiodarone. Um, you can select that. Amiodarone is an antidysrhythmic. It's just a much stronger antidysrhythmic than cardizem. And there's a lot more side effects to amiodarone. And so it's not usually the first choice. Usually cardizem is the first choice. Cardizem is a much safer drug than amiodarone. So anticoagulants and um, cardizem. So what I want you to remember for the treatment of atrial flutter is ACC. ACC, anticoagulant, cardizem, cardioversion. If the, and they don't do, they don't do both cardizem. Well, they don't say start them on cardizem and schedule them for a cardioversion. This synchronized cardioversion, not defibrillation, synchronized cardioversion. And so they're not going to say, well, start them on cardizem and schedule them for a cardioversion. 
what they do is they'll say, well, let's get them on an antidysrhythmic. Definitely start them an anticoagulant because we don't want them to throw a clot. Put them on, a, on an antidysrhythmic. If that doesn't work, we can schedule them for a cardioversion. So these are your possible options. Anticoagulant, cardism, cardioversion. So remember, ACC for a flutter. A flutter is a more P's than QRS's. It's a sawtooth P wave. It's very classic. I don't believe that the A flutter they put on the NCLEX is going to look any different from this one. You may see some slightly different looking ones in real life because everybody's different and can always look a little bit different than this. But on the NCLEX, it's going to look just like this. This is classic A flutter. So if you see this, you say, well, that's A flutter. I know what that is. Now they say, what's the treatment for it? And you go, for sure, an anticoagulant and an antidysrhythmic and then possibly uh, cardioversion. So ACC, anticoagulant, cardizem, and cardioversion. Okay, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, clinically, we treat exactly like a flutter. So do you know what the treatment for AFib is? It's ACC, anticoagulant, cardizem, cardioversion, because the risks of anti AFib are exactly the same as a flutter. For all intents and purposes, from a nursing perspective, nursing care at the bedside is exactly the same for AFib and a flutter. The slightly different pathology, but we still have a, a, a atria that's firing too fast. And in this case, it's fibrillating. It's going so fast. There's so many, there's so many P waves, it's not even possible to count them. Like I could count them in the flutter. It, there was a lot, but I could count them. Here, there's so many, I can't even count them, and they're kind of even um, over top of each other. So we still have a narrow QRS. Remember, a narrow QRS tells me that the electrical impulse is traveling quickly through the ventricles, which is exactly what I want. I want it to travel quickly through the ventricles, and that's what I want. So I go, well, that's good. I'm glad I have a narrow QRS, but there's no pattern to the P waves. So do you notice how there's so many P waves, it's hard to even tell? And what, what we have a tendency to do is go, well, I see P waves there. I mean, this could be a P wave. This could be a P wave. This could definitely, look at all these P waves here. Sharon, there's P waves. You're right, there are P waves. But there's no pattern to them. Now, look, we spent the entire last video looking at P waves, and we circled them, right? And I said, in your head, what you should always do when you see a rhythm is in your head, circle the P waves. If you can actually physically do it, do it. But if you can't, like if you're on the NCLEX, you go, I'm going to circle the P waves. And if you circle them and they're obvious and they're nice and upright, and there's one for every QRS, you go, okay, that's a nice upright P wave. That's a sinus rhythm. But here you look at it and you go, I'm not even sure what to circle. There's just no pattern. Now, it, that's different than flutter. Flutter has a pattern. Notice that flutter has a distinct pattern here. I can, they, they are slightly different, but for the most part, they look exactly alike, one after the other, after the other, after the other. There is a pattern. With fibrillation, and you should remember this for the word fibrillation, whenever you hear the word fibrillation, you should think no pattern. Because atrial fibrillation, remember the first word describes where the electrical impulse is being generated. Atrial fibrillation, I mean, there's no pattern to the P waves, because atria are the P waves, right? Atrial fibrillation, there's no pattern to the P waves. It means the atria are fibrillating. But if it's ventricular fibrillation, that means the ventricles are fibrillating and there's no pattern to the QRSs. Remember, the P wave is the, the atria and the QRSs are the ventricles. P waves are atria, QRSs are ventricles. So if you have atrial fibrillation, there's no pattern to the P waves. If you have ventricular fibrillation, there's no pattern to the QRSs. And um, I will have, the next video will be on ventricular rhythms, and I will talk about the difference between ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, because I used to get those two things uh, mixed up. Anyway, this time we're talking about atrial fibrillation. So there's no pattern to the P wave. You still have a narrow QRS. There's no pattern to the P wave, and it is always irregular. Did you know the, the number one dysrhythmia, outside of sinus rhythms, the number one dysrhythmia is AFib? It is the most common dysrhythmia that's out there. And, and it's always irregular. And since it's so common and it's always irregular, it's the only, well, other than some heart blocks, you don't need to know heart blocks for NCLEX. Other than some heart blocks, it's the only rhythm that is always irregular. Always. 
So if you're if you get a rhythm on the NCLEX and it, you look at it and just by eyeballing it, you go, well, that's irregular. I mean, it's not marching out, right? Marching out is regular. Done, 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 done. That's regular. Irregular is done, 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 right? It's irregular. There's no pattern to it. And so it's irregular and AFib is always irregular. So if you ever see a rhythm like this where you go, well, the narrow QRSs are narrow. I like that, but it's irregular and I can't see a pattern to the P wave. Darn it, that is atrial fibrillation. And the ventricular rate may be slow, fast, or normal for the same reason of a flutter. Sometimes the AV node says, hey, I'll take a, little, a, few more, a few more electrical impulses. And sometimes they say, heck no, I'm not taking them. I'm tired. We had a contract. I'm not taking more than the normal 60 to 100. So it's irregular, but sometimes the rate is slow. Sometimes it's fast. And sometimes it's normal. It has the same exact problem as a flutter. The primary problem is we're concerned they're going to throw a clot. So what's the treatment for AFib? ACC, anticoagulant, cardiosem, and cardioversion, exactly like A-flutter. So that's why I said A-flutter and A-fib are clinically the same for nurses at the bedside. We treat them exactly the same. Now, from an NCLEX perspective, the questions may be slightly different. And if they ask you to identify a rhythm, you want to be able to differentiate between A-flutter and A-fib for sure. All right, the last one I want to talk about is atrial tachycardia. Now, this is often referred to clinically as supra ventricular tachycardia. Supra means above, Tachy uh, supra uh, above the ventricles. Well, what are above the ventricles? The atria. So atrial tachycardia is often referred to as supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. I don't know how they refer to it on the NCLEX, um, but e they're kind of uh, synonyms for each other. Now, this is still this is not a ventricular rhythm, right? So if it, it, it's above the ventricle rhythm, it's an atrial rhythm. And so the QRS is still narrow. And if you look at this, make it a little bigger for you. I hate it when I lose my mouse. So you, it's hard to tell, but here's where it starts. And the interesting thing is the S is all the way down here. This actually has a depressed ST segment because this is the S and this is the T. So SVT or atrial tachycardia almost always has a depressed ST segment. And so the QRS ends all the way down here. So it starts right here and it ends right here. So it's actually only two boxes wide. And you might go, well, I thought it stopped all the way over here, right? All the way over here. No, it doesn't stop all the way over here. I hope you can see my little hand there. Um, it doesn't stop all the way over here. It stops down here. It stops down here. It stops down here. It stops down here. So find, if you're measuring the QRS, make sure you find one where it's really obvious where it stops because sometimes it's not that obvious. Like this one here is super obvious where it stops. So it starts here and it stops here. It's about two boxes. So it's still a narrow QRS. But I want you to notice there's only one wave between narrow QRSs. So this is a narrow QRS with one wave between narrow QRSs and it's really fast. And do you know why there's only one wave between narrow QRSs? Is because it's going so fast that on the page, the P and the T overlap. The P and the T overlap. So it looks like one wave. But because you cannot see the P wave, you cannot see a distinct P wave, you cannot call it a sinus tachycardia. You know it's narrow QRS, so you can call it an atrial tachycardia, but you can't call it a sinus tachycardia because it only has one wave between those narrow QRSs, and the rate is greater than 140. Now, I don't know how long this strip is. Let me go. One, two, three, four, five. So that's one second. One, two, three, four, five. That's two seconds. One, two, three, four, five. That's three seconds. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five. So it is a six second strip. So let's see what the rate is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yikes. The heart rate is 190 because you count the number of QRSs and multiply it times 10. So the heart rate's 190, so it's very clearly over 140. It's very fast. So the primary problem here is decreased cardiac output. And here's why it's going so fast that the ventricles don't have time to fill between contractions. Remember, each 
each big box is 0.20 seconds. So let's see. If we can look and see how much time is between QRSs, let's count the number of boxes. So this one starts on a line here. So there's 0 0.20 seconds, 0 0.24, 0 0.28, 0.32. So there's a third of a second, one third of a second between ventricular contractions. How much time is that to fill? Well, that's no time to fill. There's no time to fill. The cardiac output is really low because there's just no, there's no blood getting into the ventricles. And when the cardiac output is low, you're not perfusing your tissues, right? Impaired tissue perfusion. If you can't get blood to your tissues, what do you look like? Well, you look pale. Your pulses are weak. Difficulty concentrating, you may be lethargic, you may be confused, you may be difficult to arouse. How about urine output? Is it going to go up or down? Urine output is going to go down, right? So you have impaired tissue perfusion. They may even have chest pain. Well, the problem isn't that they have coronary artery disease. The problem is their heart rate is too fast. They don't have enough time to fill. you got to get the heart rate down. So for ATAC, remember for ATAC, you do VAC. ATAC, you do VAC. Vagal adenosine cardioversion. You don't have to do all of them. First walk in the room, go try to get them to vagal down, right? Bear down, right? Bear down, which is why someone who's bradycardic, we don't want them to strain. That's why we give cardiac patients stool softeners. It's a general rule that cardiac patients get stool softeners because we don't want them to, to vagal down accidentally. So this time you do want them to vagal down intentionally. You're trying to get their heart rate down and it may work. It might work. That may be all you need to do. If that doesn't work, then the next treatment is adenosine. Adenosine is IV push. Uh, if you haven't heard of adenosine, you should look it up. You need to know it for the NCLEX. It's classic drug for ATAC or SVT. And it's IV push. It's only given IV push. And it's given very, very fast IV push. As fast as you've ever pushed anything in, you push in adenosine. So you push it in super fast. And it stops the heart. It actually goes, well, it's supposed to go flatline. It doesn't work on everybody, but it's supposed to go flatline. And it could go flatline for 20 seconds. And the, But don't tell the patient that. Don't say, oh, your heart's going to stop. Well, what? I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want you to stop my heart. So don't tell them that. Just tell them they may feel some chest pain, some pressure. So what happens is they go flatline, and then you're, you hope, and usually what happens is the sinus node picks back up, and they go back into a sinus rhythm, and they're fine. So that's usually what happens. doesn't always work. Sometimes you can give adenosine a couple times. Um, it's usually done in the ED, um, sometimes in the ICU. I've never pushed adenosine on the, at the bedside, um, unless it was during a code situation. If you, if you did a code situation, you could have adenosine pushed at the bedside. Um, Otherwise, anyway, um, if it doesn't work, you can cardiovert them. That's synchronized cardioversion. So you don't do both. You don't, I mean, you don't say, well, let's give them adenosine and then schedule cardioversion. No, no, no. You do cardioversion if the adenosine doesn't work. Okay? So ATAC is VAC, and the, the concern is decreased cardiac output with impaired tissue perfusion, and you need to get that heart rate down so that they're not having chest pain and pale and all kinds of problems. So just to remind you, this is from a couple videos ago. It's under um, pressure and perfusion. So if you haven't watched the pressure and perfusion video, this is what explains this concept. So I just want to remind you, if you've watched it, I'm just reminding you that if blood pressure equals cardiac output times vascular resistance, if cardiac output goes down, and that's what we're concerned about, right, with ATAC or SVT, we're concerned about cardiac output going down because we don't have time to fill the ventricles. If cardiac output goes down, then blood pressure goes down. And if blood pressure goes down, then tissue perfusion is impaired. So if you don't understand that and you haven't watched pressure and perfusion video, go ahead and do that. Let's do just a couple questions uh, based on what we just talked about. Uh, and also based on the sinus, um, the sinus video that, that I did previously. So these questions can come from the content in either one of those. Well, the last one or this one. The nurse is caring for a patient with atrial fib. All right, well, this is AFib. We know what that is. In addition to an antidysrhythmic, what medication does the nurse plan to administer? Well, ACC is the treatment for AFib. ACC is what? <clears throat> An anticoagulant, cardizem, cardioversion. So antidysrhythmic is the cardizem. That's an antidysrhythmic. So what else do we want to give them? We want to give them an anticoagulant. Which of these drugs is an anticoagulant? Well, heparin is the only anticoagulant. So you need to remember ACC. Don't let yourself get confused and go, well, maybe, 
maybe we could give him dobutamine. Well, no, we're not giving him dobutamine. That's not how we treat AFib. We treat it with anticoagulants and antidysrhythmics. So the correct answer is heparin. The nurse is caring for a patient on a telemetry unit who has a regular heart rhythm and a rate of 60. Sounds good so far. And don't say, well, 60 is low. 60 is not low. 60 is the low end of normal, but it's still normal. A P wave precedes each QRS. Sounds good. That's what I want. Additional vital signs are as follows. So they're all normal. Blood pressure is fine. Heart rate, uh, res heart rate was 60. Respiratory rate 16. Temperature is normal. All the vital signs are normal. They got a P before every QRS. All these medications are available on the med, med rec. What action does the nurse take? Well, everything's normal. We're not going to do anything. This is totally fine. We're not going to administer atropine. Atropine slow, uh, increases heart rate. It raises heart rate. We're not going to administer digoxin. So let me just say this increases heart rate. We're not going to administer digoxin. That decreases heart rate. We're not going to administer clonidine. That's just, that's for blood pressure. And the blood pressure is obviously fine. So we're just going to continue to monitor them. And don't say, see, if you say to yourself 60 beats is too low, you might go, well, maybe I need to give them atropine. You don't need to give them atropine. In fact, even if they said uh, that the heart rate was 58, I still wouldn't give them atropine. I would need to see that the heart rate was low and the blood pressure was low. Again, go back and watch the pressure and perfusion lecture if you don't understand why that is. So in this case, we continue to monitor. Patient with AFib with rapid ventricular response. All right. So remember rapid ventricular response? The um, AV node usually says, I'm not taking more, more impulses than what, you're, than what I'm agreed to take. Well, in this case, the AV node has somehow taken a lot of electrical impulses. So a AFib with rapid ventricular response means the heart rate is usually over 120. That's what AFib with RVR means. So if you don't know that, write it down and say AFib with RVR means the heart rate's over 120, usually over 130, but it's faster than normal. Um, okay, so they have AFib with RVR and has received a medication to slow the ventricular rate. Good. All right. Well, I just overthought that. Okay, so the pulse is now 88. Good. <laughs> okay, I just overthought that question. Uh, so now it's, it's fine. So in which additional therapy does the nurse plan? Well, AFib is what? ACC, anticoagulants, cardizem, cardioversion. Well, the, the um, antidysrhythmic worked. Okay, the antidysrhythmic worked. It slowed the heart rate down. So what else do we have to do? Well, we have to do an anticoagulant. We're not doing synchronized cardioversion. That's only if the anticoagulant didn't work. Um, it says, which additional therapy? We don't know that they're going for EPS studies. They may, but I don't want to assume that. Anticoagulant. See, I know they have to get an anticoagulant because they're still in AFib. Will they have ablation? They might. Ablation is a treatment for AFib. EPS is, is an assessment a study, diagnostic test for AFib. Synchronized cardioversion is a treatment for AFib. But it's, but I, this is a rule you should remember. Don't answer the, don't pick the answer you're not sure about over the answer you are sure about. So don't say, well, it could be ablation. You're right, it could be. But we know they have to have an anticoagulant because we know for AFib, ACC is the treatment, right? Anticoagulant, cardizem, cardioversion. And so we have to give them an anticoagulant. So don't pick the answer you're unsure about over the answer you are sure about. Which waveform indicates proper function of the sinoatrial node? So we want to know what tells us the SA node is firing properly. The QRS complex is present. Well, that doesn't tell us anything about the SA node. The PR interval is 0.24. That doesn't tell us anything about the um, SA node. And I know you probably are like, I need to know PR interval. And Sharon, you didn't teach it to us. Okay, you're right. I didn't teach it to you. I don't think it's particularly necessary uh, to know for the NCLEX. Is it necessary to know for clinical? Absolutely. I hope you know PR interval, but I don't think it's necessary to necessarily know for the NCLEX. A P wave precedes every QRS. Well, I know that's, see, I'm looking for something that says P wave because SA note is P wave. So if it doesn't say P wave, I'm not picking the answer, but that's the one that says P wave. So yeah, precedes the QRS. That's, that tells me it's working. The ST segment is elevated. Well, the ST segment has nothing to do with the SA note. So the only one I can pick is C. Don't make this harder than it should be. Do not make this harder than it should be. What teaching does the nurse include for a patient with AFib who has a new prescription for warfarin? Okay, remember I said that sometimes people go home with warfarin. It's an anticoagulant. So what's the concern with someone who's on an anticoagulant long-term? Bleeding. 
And if you're testing conceptually, which if you've watched any of my other videos, you know I tell you over and over and over and over again, test conceptually, which means you say, well, I know I'm concerned about bleeding. I don't know what the answer is going to say, but I, if it indicates that the patient should watch for bleeding, then I'm going to pick it, even if it's not the exact words that I would have chosen. It's important to consume a diet high in green leafy vegetables. Well, that has nothing to do with bleeding. You would take aspirin or ibuprofen for headache. Well, aspirin increases the risk for bleeding. I don't like that. Plus, it doesn't say anything about bleeding. Report nosebleeds to your provider. Oh, there's the bleeding option. Avoid caffeinated beverages. So again, if I knew what I was looking for before I even looked at the answers, I knew I was something related to bleeding. The only one that says anything about watch for bleeding is C. So I have to pick it. I have to. Now, if you're wondering, you want to not consume a diet high in green leafy vegetables. Uh, green leafy vegetables are high in vitamin K, and that is the antidote to warfarin. So you do not want to consume a diet high in green leafy vegetables. You don't want to take aspirin with warfarin because aspirin is an antiplatelet as well as ibuprofen. It can increase bleeding, so I don't want to take that. Avoid caffeinated beverages. There's nothing wrong with caffeine uh, related to bleeding. Now, do they want to avoid caffeinated beverages? Probably. <laughs> they probably do, honestly. Um, but that's not the one that I have to include. I have to include about bleeding because that's the biggest risk. A patient's rhythm strip shows a heart rate of 116. So that's fast. Uh, it's not over 140, but it's fast. One P wave occurring before each QRS, that's good. A PR interval measuring 0.16. I might say, well, I don't know if that's normal. Fine. QRS measuring 0.08. Well, 0.08 is fine. Okay, so that's narrow. So I like that. So I have a P wave and a narrow QRS and the rate of 116. What does the nurse interpret this? Well, when I have a P wave, it doesn't say upright, but because it didn't say it wasn't upright, I'm going to assume it's upright. Because it didn't, if it, it would have said like sawtooth P wave, or it would have said a fibrillating P wave, or something like that. It just said a, a P wave, so I'm going to assume it's upright. QRS is narrow, 0.08, and the rate is 116. Well, what do I know that is? I know that's sinus tachycardia, because an upright P wave and a narrow QRS is always sinus. It's faster than 100, so it's sinus tachycardia. So I have to. Oh, look at that! It says correct. I forgot to get rid of that. Sorry about that. Obviously, I was worried I wasn't going to remember what the right answer was. I knew it was sinus tachycardia, y'all. So sinus tachycardia. So that's the correct answer. Okay. Okay, well, um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope this is helpful to you. I'm going to do one more rhythm uh, video. I'm going to do uh, ventricular dysrhythmias, talk about those. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day. Go to clinic reviews to see when our reviews are. I have some... Um, upcoming reviews. And we have actually a lot coming up because it's uh, December. We always have a lot coming up in December. All right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.